Tripartite Tractate. Introduction. In order to be able to speak about exalted things, it is necessary that we begin with the Father, who is the root of the all, and from whom we have obtained grace to speak about him. For he existed before anything else had come into being except him alone. The Father. The Father is singular while being many, for he is first and he is unique, though without being solitary. How else could he be a father? For from the word father it follows that there is a son. That singular one who is the only father is, in fact, like a tree that has a trunk, branches, and fruit. Of him it may be said that he is a true father, incomparable and immutable, because he is truly singular and God. For no one is God for him, and no one is father to him. He has not been born, and no other has brought him into being. For whoever is the father of somebody, or his maker, himself has a father and a maker in turn. It is certainly possible that he may become the father and the maker of whoever comes into being from him and is made by him. Still, he is not a father in the true sense, or a god, insofar as someone has given birth to him and has brought him into being. The only father and god in the true sense, therefore, is the one who has been born by no one, but who on the contrary, has given birth to the all and has brought it into being. He is without beginning and without end, for not only is he without end, being unborn makes him immortal as well, but he is also unchangeable in his eternal being, in that which he is, in that which makes him immutable, and that which makes him great. He does not move himself away from what he is, nor can anyone else force him against his will to cease being what he is, for no one has made him what he is. Therefore, neither does he change himself, nor will another be able to move him from that in which he is, from what he is, from his way of being, or from his greatness. Thus he cannot be moved nor is it possible for another to change him into a different form, either by reducing him or changing him or making him less. For this is truly and veritably how he is unchangeable and immutable, being clothed in immutability. Thus he is called without beginning and without end, not only because he is unborn and immortal, but also because, just as he is without beginning, he is also without end. In his manner of being, he is incomprehensible in his greatness, inscrutable in his wisdom, invincible in his might, and unfathomable in his sweetness. In the true sense, he alone, the good, unborn, and perfect Father who lacks nothing, is complete filled with everything he possesses, excellent and precious qualities of every kind. Moreover, he has no envy, which means that all he owns he gives away, without being affected and suffering no loss by his gifts. For he is rich from the things he gives away and finds rest in what he graciously bestows. Therefore, his manner, his form, and his greatness are such that nothing else exists beside him from the beginning, neither a place in which he dwells, from which he has gone forth, or to which he will return, nor an original form that he used as a model for his work, nor fatigue that came over him as a result of what he did, nor matter that lay before him and from which he made the things that he made, nor a substance inside him and from which he brought forth the things he brought forth, nor a collaborator with whom he collaborated on the things that he created. 
to speak in such a way is ignorant. Rather, he himself, being good, lacking nothing, perfect and complete, is everything. There is no name that suits him among those that may be conceived, spoken, seen, or grasped, however brilliant, exalted, or glorious. It is, to be sure, possible to speak such names in order to glorify and praise him to the extent of the capacity of whoever wants to give glory. But the way he is in himself, his own manner of being, that no mind can conceive, no word express, no eye see, and no body touch. So incomprehensible is his greatness, so unfathomable his depth, so immeasurable his exaltedness, and so boundless his extension. Such is the nature of the unborn one. He does not get to work starting from something other than himself, nor does he have a partner. This would imply a limitation. But he has such an existence, that he has neither figure nor form that can be perceived by the senses, this means that he is incomprehensible as well, and if he is incomprehensible, it follows that he is unknowable. The Generation of the Sun Being inconceivable for any thought, invisible for anything, unutterable for any word, and untouchable for any hand, only he himself knows himself the way he is with his form and his greatness and his magnitude, and only he is able to conceive himself, name himself, and grasp himself. For he, the inconceivable, ineffable, incomprehensible, and unchangeable one, is mind for himself, eye for himself, mouth for himself, and form for himself. It is also himself that he conceives, sees, speaks and grasps. That which he conceives, sees and speaks is nourishment and delight, truth, joy and rest, and that which he thinks surpasses every wisdom, excels every mind, excels every glory, excels every beauty and every sweetness, every greatness, every depth, and every exaltedness. Now, Although he is unknowable in his nature and possesses all those supreme qualities I have described, he is nevertheless able, if he so desires, to grant knowledge, in order that he may be known, out of his abundant sweetness. He possesses power, which is his will. For the moment, however, he holds himself back in silence. He, who is the greatest, being the cause of the generation of the members of the All into eternal existence, for it is truly his ineffable self that he engenders. It is self-generation where he conceives of himself and knows himself as he is. He brings forth something worthy of the admiration, glory, praise, and honor that belong to himself. Through his boundless greatness, his inscrutable wisdom, his immeasurable power, and his sweetness that is beyond tasting. It is he himself who puts forth in this manner of generation, and who receives glory and praise, admiration and love, and it is also he who gives himself glory, admiration, praise, and love. This he has as a son dwelling in him, keeping silent about him, and this is the ineffable within the ineffable the invisible, the ungraspable, the inconceivable within the inconceivable. This is how he exists eternally within himself, as we have explained by knowing himself in himself. The Father bore him without generation, so that he exists by the Father having him as a thought. That is, his thought about himself, his sensation of himself, and of his eternal being. This is what in truth is meant by silence, or wisdom, or grace, as the latter is also rightly called. 
just as the Father truly is one before whom no other existed, and after whom there is no other unborn one, in the same way the Son, as well as truly before whom no other Son existed, and after whom there is no other. For that reason he is a firstborn and only Son, firstborn because there was no one before him, and the only Son because there is no one after him, the pre-existent church. Moreover, he has his fruit, though it remained unknown because of his overwhelming greatness, and he wished to make it known because of his abundant sweetness. He revealed his inscrutable power, and he mixed it with plentiful abundance of his generosity, for not only the Son, but also the church exists from the beginning. If somebody now thinks that this statement is contradicted by the fact that the Son is an only Son, that is not so, because of the mystery of the matter. For just as the Father is singular and was shown to be his own Father, so also the Son may be found to be his own brother, without generation and without beginning. It is himself that the Father admires as Father, and to whom he gives glory, praise, and love, and it is equally himself that he conceives of as Son, in accordance with the qualities, without beginning and without end. This is how the matter is, being firmly established. His offspring, the ones who are, are without number and limit, at the same time indivisible. They have issued from him, the Son and the Father, in the same way as kisses, when two people abundantly embrace one another in a good and insatiable thought. It is a single embrace, but consists of many kisses. This is the church that consists of many people and exists before the aeons, and is justly called the aeons of the aeons. This is the nature of these holy, imperishable spirits upon which the Son rests since it is his essence, just as the Father rests upon the Son, the Church exists in the properties and qualities in which the Father and the Son exist, and which I have described earlier. Thus it consists of innumerable births of aeons, and these in turn give birth in infinite number through the qualities and properties in which they exist. These are a community formed with one another, and with the ones who have gone forth from them, and the Son, because of whom they exist as glory. For this reason no mind can conceive of them, such is the perfection of that place, nor can words speak of them, for they are ineffable, unnameable, and inconceivable. Only they are able to name themselves in order to conceive of themselves, for they are not rooted here below, those who belong to that place are ineffable and innumerable in accordance with the special structure that this is. And this is the form and the manner, and this is the kind, the joy and the delight of the nameless, unnameable, inconceivable, invisible, and ungraspable unborn one. It is the fullness of his fatherhood, whereby his abundance becomes procreation, the all before it was brought forth. Of the aeons existed eternally in the Father's thought, and he was like a thought and a place for them. And once it was decided that they should be born, he who possesses all power desired to take and bring what was incomplete out of those who were within him. But he is as he is, for he is a spring that is not diminished by the water flowing from it. As long as they remained in the Father's thought, that is, while they were in the hidden depth, the depth himself certainly knew them, but they, on their part, were incapable of knowing the depth in which they found themselves, nor could they know themselves or anything else. In other words, they existed with the Father, but did not exist for themselves. Rather, the kind of existence they had was like that of a seed or it may be compared with that of an embryo. He had made them in the manner of the word, 
which exists in a seminal state before the things it will bring forth have yet come into being. The Father's plan. For that reason, the Father had also thought in advance that they should exist not only for himself, but should exist for themselves as well, that they should remain in his thought as mental substance, but also exist for themselves. He sowed a thought as a seed of, in order that they might understand what kind of father they have. He showed grace and provided the first form that they might perceive whom they have for a father. The name of the father he granted them by means of a voice calling out to them that he who is, is by that name and possessing it. One comes into being. How exalted the name was, however, they did not realize. For as long as the infant is in the state of an embryo, it has what it needs without ever having seen the one who sowed it. For that reason, they had this only as an object to be sought after. They understood that he existed, and they desired to find out who the existing one might be. But the Father is good and perfect, and just as he did not close himself to them, so that they should remain forever in his thought, but granted that they should come into being for themselves also, in the same way he would gracefully allow them to understand who the one who is, is, that is, the one who knows himself eternally. Receive form in order to know the one who is, is, in the same way as when one is brought forth here below. When one is born, one finds oneself in the light and is able to see one's parents. The all is not made perfect from the beginning. For the Father produced the all like a little child, like a drop from a spring, like a blossom from a vine, like a shoot, so that they needed nourishment, growth, and perfection. He withheld the perfection for a time, Having kept it in his mind from the beginning, he possesses it from the beginning and looks at it, but he concealed it for those who had come forth from him. This was not out of jealousy, but it was in order that the aeons should not receive their perfection from the beginning, and thereby exalt themselves in glory as equal to the Father, and think that they had achieved this perfection out of themselves. But just as they came into existence because it pleased him, so also it was because it pleased him that he benevolently granted them a perfect thought that would make them faultless. The Father reveals himself in the Son through the hymns of the mind. That which he now made to rise like a light for those who had gone forth from himself, that by which they are given a name, that is the Son, the full and faultlessly perfect one. The Father brought him forth while he remained united with the one from whom he had gone forth, receiving glory together, the all, according to the ability of each one to receive him. This is not yet his greatness that they have received. Rather, he exists only partially in the manner, the form, and the greatness that he is. For they are able to see him and to speak with regard to what they know about him since they carry him and he carries them, and they are able to reach him as well, though he remains the way he is, the inimitable one, in order that the Father may be glorified by each and every one and reveal himself. And being hidden and invisible in his ineffability, he is admired in the mind. For this reason, his great exaltedness can be revealed when they speak about him and see him, gratefully singing hymns to him about his abundant sweetness. The ability of the aeons to procreate. And just as the marvels of silence are eternal births, births of the mind, so also the faculties of the word are spiritual emissions. Since they both belong to the word, they are, and thoughts that are given birth by it, eternally living roots that have been manifested for they are births that have issued from them, minds and spiritual births, for the glory of the Father. 
and there is no need of a voice, since they are spirits of mind and word, nor is there any need to perform an action for what they desire to do. But in the same manner that the Father exists, so do those who have issued from him also bring forth all that they wish. And that which they think, that which they say, that which they move toward, that which they are in, and that which they sing as hymns, giving glory he has as sons. For this is their power of giving birth, as with the ones from whom they have gone forth, by mutual help, for they have been helping one another in the same way as those unborn. The Distinction Between the Father and the Son Now the Father, insofar as he is elevated above the members of the All, is unknowable and incomprehensible. His greatness is so immense that if he had revealed himself at once and suddenly, even the highest of the aeons that have gone forth from him would have perished. For that reason, he withheld his power and his impassibility, and that in which he is, remaining ineffable and unnameable, transcending all mind and all speech. He, on the other hand, extended himself and spread himself out. It is he who gave firmness, location, and a dwelling place to the All. According to one of his names, he is in fact Father of the All. Through his constant suffering on their behalf, having sown in their minds the idea that they should seek what exceeds there, by making them perceivable that he is and thus making them seek what he might be. He was given them as delight and nourishment, joy and abundant illumination, and this is his compassion, the knowledge he provides, and his union with them, and this is he who is called, and who is the Son. He is the sum of the All, and they have understood who he is, and he is clothed. On the other hand, that is the one by reason of whom he is called Son, the one about whom they perceived that he exists, and that they have been seeking him. This is the one who exists as Father, and of whom one can neither speak nor think. He is the one who exists first, for no one can conceive of him, or think of him, or draw near to that place toward the exalted, toward the truly pre-existent. But every name that is thought or spoken about him is brought forth in glorification as a trace of him, according to the capacity of each one of those who give him glory. The Son as the Name and the Names of the Father He, however, whose light dawned from him, stretching himself out to give birth and knowledge to the members of the All. He is all these names without falsehood, and he truly is the Father's only first man. This is the one I call the form of the formless, the body of the incorporeal, the face of the invisible, the word of the inexpressible, the mind of the inconceivable, the spring that flowed from him, the root of those who have been rooted, the God of those who are ready, the light of those he illuminates, the will of those he has willed, the providence of those for whom he provides, the wisdom of those he has made wise, the strength of those he has given strength, the assembly of those with whom he is present, the revelation of that which is sought after, the eye of those who see, the spirit of those who breathe, the life of those who live, the unity of those who are united. While all the members of the All exist in the single one, as he clothes himself completely and is in his single name, he is never called by it, and in the same unitary way they are simultaneously this single one, as well as all of them. He is not divided as a body, nor is he split apart by the names in which he exists in the sense that this is one thing and that is something else, nor does he change by, nor does he alter through the names in which he is, being now like this and now something different, 
so that he would be one person now and someone else at another time. Rather, he is entirely himself forever. He is each and every one of the members of the All eternally at the same time. He is what all of them are, as Father of the All, and the members of the All are the Father as well. For he is himself knowledge for himself, and he is each one of his qualities and powers, and he is himself the eye for all that he knows, seeing all of it in himself, having a son and form. Thus his powers and qualities are innumerable and inaudible because of the way in which he gives birth to them. The births of his words, the births of his words, his commands, and his members of the all are innumerable and indivisible. He knows them, for they are himself. When they speak, they are all in the one single name, and if he brings them forth, it is in order that they may be found to exist as individual qualities, forming a unity. The Aeons Procreate He did not, however, reveal his multiplicity at once to the members of the All, nor did he reveal his sameness to those who had issued forth from him. Now, all those who had gone forth from him, that is, the Aeons of the Aeons, being emissions born of a procreative nature, also procreate through their own procreative nature, to the glory of the Father, just as he had been the cause of their existence. This is what we said earlier. He makes the aeons into roots and springs and fathers, for that which they glorified, they bore, for it possesses knowledge and wisdom, and they have understood that they have gone forth from the knowledge and the understanding of the All. If the members of the All had risen to give glory according to the individual powers of each aeon, they would have brought forth a glory that was only a semblance of the Father, who himself is the All. For that reason they were drawn, through the singing of praise and through the power of the oneness of him whom they had come forth, into mutual intermingling, union and oneness. From their assembled fullness, they offered a glorification worthy of the Father, an image that was one and at the same time many, because it was brought forth for the glory of the One, and because they had come forward toward Him, who Himself is the entirety of the All. The Three Fruits of Glorification This, then, was a tribute from the Aeons to the One who had brought forth the All a first fruit offering of those who are immortal and eternal. For when it issued from the living aeons, it left them perfect and full, caused by something perfect and full, since they were full and perfect, having given glory in a perfect manner in communion. For inasmuch as the Father lacks nothing, he returns the glory they give to those who glorify him, so as to make them manifest by what he himself is. The cause that brought about for them the second glorification is in fact that which was returned unto them from the Father. When they understood the grace from the Father through which they had borne fruit with one another, so that just as they had been bringing forth by glorifying the Father, in the same way they might also themselves be made manifest in their act of giving glory, so as to be revealed as being perfect. They became fathers of the third glorification, which was produced in accordance with the free will and the power they had been born with, enabling them to give glory in unison, while at the same time independently of one another, according to the will of each. Thus both the first and the second glorifications are perfect and full, for they are manifestations of the perfect and full Father and of the perfect things that issued from the glorification of him who is perfect. The fruit of the third glorification, however, is produced by the will of each individual aeon and of each of the Father's qualities and powers. This fruit is a perfect fullness to the extent that what the aeons desire and are capable of in giving glory to the Father comes from their union as well as from each of them individually. For this reason,
they exist as minds over minds, words over words, superiors over superiors, degrees over degrees, being ranked one above the other. Each of those who glorify has his own station, rank, dwelling place, and place of rest, which is the glorification he brings forth. The Harmony of the Aeons For those who glorify the Father, all have their eternal offspring. They give birth by the way of mutual help, and their emissions are unlimited and immeasurable, and no jealousy exists on the part of the Father toward those who have come forth from him, because they are producing something like himself and his image, for it is he himself who is in the members of the All, giving birth and revealing himself. Whomever he desires to make a father, he himself is their father, or a god, he himself is their god, and he makes into members of the All the ones for whom he himself is the All. In that place rightfully belong all those good names that the angels and rulers who have come into being in the world share as well, although the latter have nothing in common with the eternal ones. The Aeons Search for the Father The whole structure of Aeons, then, is yearning and seeking to find the Father perfectly and completely, and that is their irreproachable union. Although the Father does reveal himself, he did not want them to know him from eternity, but he presented himself as something to be reflected upon and sought after, while keeping for himself that by which he is inscrutably pre-existent. For the Father gave the aeons a starting point and a root, so that they are stations on the calm road leading to him, as to a school of good conduct. For he spread out faith and prayer for what they do not see, a firm hope in what they do not comprehend, a fertile love longing for what they do not behold, an eternally receptive understanding of the mind, a blessing that is richness and freedom, and for their thoughts, the wisdom of one whose desire is the glory of the Father. The Spirit For the Father, the Exalted One, they know by His will which is the Spirit that breathes through the members of the All and gives them a thought to search for the unknown, just as somebody is moved by a fragrance to seek the source of that fragrance, and the fragrance of the Father surpasses such unworthy things for its sweetness lets the aeons sense an indescribable pleasure and gives them the thought that they should be united with the one who desires that they should know him in oneness, and that they should assist one another through the spirit that is sown in them. They find themselves in a great and powerful inbreathing, where they are renewed in a speechless manner and are formed, having no occasion to turn away through thoughtlessness from that in which they are placed. For they do not speak but are silent about the glory of the Father, about him who has the power to speak. He manifested himself, though he cannot be spoken. They have him hidden in their thoughts. For that reason the aeons keep silent about the way the Father exists in his form, his nature, and his greatness but they have become worthy of knowing this through his spirit, for he is unnameable and inaccessible, but through his spirit, which is the trace by which he may be sought, he gives himself to them to be thought and spoken. For each of the aeons is a name corresponding to each of the Father's qualities and powers. Since he exists in many names, it is by mingling and through mutual harmony that they are able to speak of him by means of a richness of speech. Thus the Father is a single name because he is one, but nevertheless innumerable in his qualities and names. The Nature of the Emission The emission of the members of the All that comes from the One who is has not taken place by way of a division, as if it were a separation from the One who gave birth to them. Rather, their birth has the form of spreading out, by which the Father spreads himself out into that which he wishes, 
in order that those who have gone forth from him may be as well. For just as the present aeon is single, yet divided into ages, ages into years, years into seasons, seasons into months, months into days, days into hours, and hours into moments, in the same way the true aeon also is single yet multiple, being glorified by small as well as by great names according to what each is able to comprehend. Or, to use other similes, it is like a spring that remains what it is, even if it flows into rivers, lakes, streams, and canals, or like a root that spreads out into trees with branches and fruits, or like a human body that is indivisibly divided into limbs and limbs, main limbs and extremities, large ones and small. Free will, wisdom, and the collaboration of the aeons. The aeons were brought forth according to the third fruit, by using the freedom of the will and the wisdom of the Father had graciously given them for their thoughts. They do not desire to give glory together with that which the individual fullness may produce in unison as words of glorification, nor do they desire to give glory together with the all as a whole, nor does one desire to do so together with another aeon who has already attained a higher level or station than himself, without obtaining what has been desired from the one who resides in that higher name and the higher station. He receives him with himself at that higher level, and the one who desired to ascend to him engenders, as it were, himself, engendering himself through that other with what he is, renewing himself with what he has come to him from his brother, seeing him and praying to him about this matter. In order that this may happen, the one who has desired to give glory does not say anything to him about it, except this only. For a boundary, the speech is placed in the fullness, making them keep silent about the Father's unreachability, but allowing them to speak about their desire to reach him. The Presumption of the Youngest Aeon It came upon one of the aeons that he should undertake to reach the inconceivability of the Father, and to give glory to it as well as to his ineffability. It was a word belonging to the unity, although it was not one that arose out of the union of the members of the All, nor from him who had brought them forth. For he who has brought forth the All is the Father. For this Aeon was one of those who had been given wisdom, with ideas first existing independently in his mind, so as to be brought forth when he wanted it. Because of that, he had received a natural wisdom enabling him to inquire into the hidden order, being a fruit of wisdom. Thus, the free will with which the members of the All had been born caused this one to do what he wanted, with no one holding him back. Now, the intention of this word was good, because he rushed forward to give glory to the Father, even though he undertook a task beyond his power having desired to produce something perfect from a union in which he did not share and without having received orders. This aeon was the last to have been brought forth through mutual assistance, and he was the youngest in age. And before he had yet produced anything to the glory of the will and in the union of the members of the all, he acted presumptuously out of an overflowing love and rushed forward toward that which surrounds the realm of perfect glory. This happened in accordance with the Father's will. It was not without the will of the Father that this word had been brought forth, nor that he should rush forward. Rather, the Father had brought him forth for the things that he knew must take place. For the Father and the realm of the All now withdrew from him in order that the boundary should be firm and the Father had fixed, for it does not exist to prevent the unreachable from being reached, but because of the will of the Father, and also in order that the things that happened should be for the sake of an economy that was to come about. And it was not possible that it should not come to pass, for the revelation of the fullness. 
For this reason, then, it is wrong to condemn the movement that is the Word. Rather, we should speak about the movement of the Word as the cause that made an ordained economy come to pass. The Word is Divided Now, on the one hand, the Word gave birth to Himself as a perfect single one, to the glory of the Father who had desired Him and was pleased with Him. The things He had wished to grasp and reach, however, He produced as shadows, phantoms, and imitations, for He could not bear to look at the light, but looked at the depths, and He faltered. Because of this He suffered a division and a turning away. From the faltering and the division came oblivion and ignorance of oneself and of that which is. His movement upward and his design to reach the unreachable hardened for him and remained in him. The sicknesses, however, which ensued when he was beside himself arose from his faltering, that is, his failure to approach the glories of the Father, whose exaltedness is without end. That he did not reach, because he could not grasp it. The perfect part of the Logos re-enters the fullness. That which he had brought forth from himself as a unitary aeon hastened upward to that which was his, and to his kin in the fullness. He abandoned that which had come into being from deficiency, and what had issued from him in an illusion, since they did not belong to him. However, the one who had brought him forth, with superior perfection from himself, became weak after bringing him forth, like a female nature deprived of masculinity, for what issued from his presumptuous thought and his arrogance had existed from something that itself was deficient. Because of that, what was perfect in him left him and went upward to his own. He remained in the fullness and the fact that he had been saved from the served for him as a reminder. The one who hastened on high, and the one who drew him to himself, did not remain idle, but they brought forth a fruit in the fullness, with a view to overthrowing what had come into being because of the deficiency. The perfect part of the Logos re-enters the fullness, that which he had brought forth from himself is a unitary aeon hastened upward to that which was his, and to his kin in the fullness. He abandoned that which had come into being from deficiency and what had issued from him in an illusion, since they did not belong to him. However, the one who had brought him forth with superior perfection from himself became weak after bringing him forth like a female nature deprived of masculinity. For what issued from his presumptuous thought and his arrogance had existence from something that itself was deficient. Because of that, what was perfect in him left him and went upward to his own. He remained in the fullness and the fact that he had been saved from the served for him as a reminder. The one who hastened on high and the one who drew him to himself did not remain idle, but they brought forth a fruit in the fullness, with a view to overthrowing what had come into being because of the deficiency. The Offspring of the Presumptuous Thought Those who came into being from the presumptuous thought resemble in fact the fullness of whom they are imitations, though they are phantoms, shadows, and illusions, deprived of reason and light belonging to this empty thought, being nobody's offspring. For this reason also, their end will be like their beginning. Coming from that which was not, they will return to that which will not be. In their own eyes, however, they are great and powerful beings, more beautiful than the names that adorn them, though they are only their shadows, made beautiful by way of imitation. For the beauty one sees in an image derives from what the image represents. They thought of themselves that only they existed, and that they had no beginning, since they saw no one existing before them. For this reason they exhibited disobedience and rebellion, 
being unwilling to submit to the one who had brought them into existence. For they desired to command one another, and to lord it over them in their vain love of glory. And the glory that they acquired became the cause of the structure that was to be. Being imitations, then, of those above, they exalted themselves in lust for dominion, each one of them according to the magnitude of the name of which he was a shadow, fantasizing that he would become greater than his fellows. Thus the thought of these others was not idle, but in accordance with the model of those whose shadows they are, where every thought becomes a sun, so do the things they think about also become their offspring. Because of this, it came to pass that many issued from them as offspring, fighters, warriors, troublemakers, rebels, disobedient folks who love to dominate, and all the others of that sort who derive from these. The Conversion The Word, then, was the cause of these things coming into being, and he became increasingly desperate. He was dumbfounded. Instead of perfection, he saw deficiency. Instead of unity, he saw division. Instead of stability, he saw disturbance. Instead of rest, upheaval. He was unable to bring their love of disturbance to an end, nor could he destroy it. He had become utterly powerless when his wholeness and his perfection had abandoned him. Those who had come into being did not know themselves nor did they know the fullness from which they had originated, nor did they know him who had become the cause of their existence. For since the word was in such an unstable condition, he no longer attempted to bring forth offspring in the form of emissions, which are fullness of glory originated for the glory of the Father. Instead, what he brought forth were feeble and small creatures, infected with the same sickness with which he himself had been infected. The imitation that had taken place, solitarily in this state, was what had been the cause of the things that do not exist on their own account from the beginning. In this defective state he continued to produce such deficient beings, until he began to condemn the irrational things he had produced. This condemnation became a judgment directed against them, that is, those opposing the judgment, aiming at their destruction, while wrath pursues them. It is, however, a helper and savior from their disposition and their rebelliousness, for from it comes the conversion that is also called repentance, and that takes place when the word takes on a different disposition and a different mind, having turned away from evil and having turned toward the good. Remembrance and Prayer after conversion followed the remembrance of those who exist and the prayer on behalf of the one who had returned to himself by means of what is good. First, he remembered the one who was in the fullness and entreated him, then his brothers one by one, though always together with their fellows, then all of them together, but before all of these, the Father. This prayer and supplication helped to make him turn toward himself and toward the All, for their remembrance of him caused him to remember the pre-existent ones, and this is the remembrance that calls out from afar and brings him back. A New Order of Powers Now, all his prayer and remembrance were numerous powers, also produced in accordance with the boundary mentioned, for there was nothing idle in his thought, these powers were much better and greater than those belonging to the imitation, for the latter have the substance of darkness, having come into being from illusory imitation and a vain and presumptuous thought. These, on the other hand, are from a thought that had known them in advance. Those, then, are like oblivion and heavy sleep. They are like people who have troubled dreams in which someone pursues them and they are surrounded. These others, however, are for him like beings of light who are waiting for the rising sun, as when the dreamers have been able to see dreams in their sleep that are truly sweet. They, 
the emissions of the remembrance. They did not have more substance, nor did they have greater glory, for they are not equal to the pre-existent ones. If, on the other hand, they were superior to the imitations, the only thing that made them elevated above them was that they were from a good disposition, for they had not come out of the sickness that arose, which is the good disposition of him who searched after the pre-existent, having prayed and brought himself to what is good. He sowed in them an inclination to seek and pray to what is glorious and pre-existent, and he also sowed in them an ability to think about it, and a power of reflection to make them realize that something greater than themselves existed before them, but they had not understood what it was. Bringing forth harmony and mutual love by means of that thought, they acted in unity and unanimity, since to unity and unanimity they owed their existence. War between the two orders. The others, moreover, they now attempted to overpower in a lust for domination, because they were nobler than those previous ones, and they had risen up against them. They had not surrendered. They thought they were self-engendered and without beginning, and with their manner of giving birth, the first to bring forth others. The two orders fought against each other, struggling for command with such result that they were engulfed by forces and material substances in accordance with the law of mutual combat, and they too acquired lust for domination and all other passions of this sort, and consequently empty vainglory pulls them all toward the desire of lust for domination, and not one of them remembers what is superior or confesses it. The powers of remembrance were adorned with the names of the pre-existent, whose likenesses they were, the order of those of this kind was in harmony with itself and with each other. It fought, however, the order of those of the imitation, because that order waged war against the likenesses, and so it acted against itself on account of its rage. Because of this, it happened, their own, against one another, many. Necessity placed them, as well, that they might prevail. He did not desist, their envy their malice, rage, violence, lust, and ignorance ruled, as they were producing various kinds of matter and all sorts of powers, mixed with one another and in great number, while the word who had been the cause of their production waited in his mind for the revelations of the hope that would come to him from above. The words hope for the word that had moved possessed hope and expectation about what is superior. He turned away from those who belonged to the shadow, in every way, since they opposed him and were very rebellious. But in those who belonged to the remembrance he found rest, and those who had come into being by way of remembrance, the word invisibly gave birth in accordance with what existed in them, to the one who had hastened upward and who was in the superior state, remembering the one who had become deficient. The word did this until there would shine forth on him from above the life-giving light born from the thought of brotherly love of the pre-existent fullness, intercession in the fullness. For the father's aeons, who had not suffered, took upon themselves the fall that had happened as if it were their own, with concern, goodness, and great kindness, the all that they should be instructed about by the one, all be confirmed through the, to the end, the deficiencies. The order that now came into being for him originated from the one who had hastened upward, and from that which he brought forth for him, from himself, and from the fullness as a whole. He who had hastened upward became on behalf of him who had become deficient, an intercessor with the emitted aeons who had come into being in accordance with what really exists. And after he had entreated them, they, on their part, consented with joy, benevolence, and harmonious agreement to help the one who had become deficient. They united and prayed to the Father with a salutary mind that help might come from above 
from the hand of the Father for his glory. For the one who had become deficient could be made perfect in no other way except by the fullness of the Father consenting, pulling him toward itself, revealing him, and giving what he lacked. The fullness produces the Son. Through this joyously willed agreement that arose, they brought forth the fruit as an offspring of their concord. It was a single one, since it came from the members of the All and manifested the countenance of the Father, of whom the Aeons had been thinking when they gave glory and prayed for help for their brother. And the Father had shared their sentiment, so that they produced this fruit willingly and with joy. The manifestation of the consent in which he had united with them, which is the Son of his will, revealed itself. The Son of the good pleasure of the All placed himself on them as a garment, by means of which he could give perfection to the one who had become deficient, and confirmation to the perfect. He is the one who is rightfully called Savior and Redeemer, the well-pleasing and the beloved, the Advocate, Christ, and the light of those who are appointed in accordance with the ones from whom he had been brought forth for he had come into being clothed in the names of those who are established. For what other name is there to call him except Son, which we have already used? For he is the knowledge of the Father who wished to become known. The aeons not only produced the countenance of the Father whom they had been glorifying, as had been written above, but they produced their own as well. For in giving glory, the aeons produced their own countenance and aspect. They were produced as an army for him, as for a king, in which those who belong to this thought share the command and are united in agreement. They went forth in a form that consisted of many forms, so that the one whom they were going to help should see those to whom he had prayed for help, as well as the one who brought it to him. For the fruit we have spoken about, and of their concord with him, is vested with the power of the All. In him the Father placed all things, what was before, what is, and what will be. He was well equipped. He revealed the things Father had placed in him. He had not given, but had entrusted them to him. He took charge of the economy of the All by means of the authority vested in him from the beginning, and the power needed to execute it. In this way he proceeded to carry out his revelation. The Son reveals himself. He in whom the Father dwells, and in whom dwell the members of the All, revealed himself first to the one who had lost his faculty, to see and showed himself to those who wanted to gain vision by shining forth with that perfect light. He first filled him with inexpressible joy, made him whole and complete, and also gave him that which came from each of the aeons, for this is the nature of the first joy. He also sowed in him invisibly a word designed for understanding, and gave him the power to detach and dispel from himself those who were disobedient to him. This is how he showed himself to him. To the ones who had come into being because of him, however, he revealed himself in a form beyond their comprehension. He came to them as a flash, revealing himself suddenly and then withdrawing, like a flash of lightning. He put an end to their mutual entanglement through this sudden revelation for which they were unprepared and which they did not expect since they had no knowledge of it. The reactions of the powers. Because of this, they became afraid and collapsed, for they could not bear the shock of the light that came upon them. The revelation was a blow to both of the two orders. Those who belonged to the remembrance, however, who have been named small, since they have a small idea that something higher existed before them, had sown in them an anticipation that what was higher would reveal itself. For that reason they greeted his revelation and bowed down before him, 
they became convinced witnesses for him and acknowledged that the light that had appeared was stronger than their opponents. Those who belonged to the imitation, however, were exceedingly frightened, for they had never before heard talk that such a sight could exist. Therefore they fell down into that pit of ignorance called the outer darkness, chaos, Hades, and the abyss. He placed them below the order of those who belonged to the remembrance, since it had been shown to be stronger than they. So those were found worthy of becoming rulers over the unspeakable darkness as their own property and the lot that fell to them. This is what he granted them, so that they too might become useful for the economy that was to be, and of which they were oblivious. Thus there is a great difference between the revelation to the one who had come into existence, and then had become deficient, and the revelation to those who came into being because of him. For to him he revealed himself inside him, being together with him, sharing his suffering, relieving him little by little, making him grow, raising him up, and finally giving himself to be enjoyed in a vision. To those who were on the outside, however, he revealed himself in a leap and a blow, and then withdrew immediately without letting them see him. The word gives thanks and brings forth a third order of powers. After the word who had become deficient was illuminated, his fullness came to be. He freed himself from those who previously had been revolting against him, became disentangled from them, and stripped himself of his former presumptuous thought. He acquired the unification of rest, as those who had been disobedient to him once before bowed down and succumbed to him. Moreover, he rejoiced in the visitation of his brothers who had come to visit him. He gave glory and praise to those who had revealed themselves to him to give help, giving thanks that he had become free from those who had rebelled against him, and admiring and praising the greatness and those who had resolved to reveal themselves to him. He brought forth living images of the living figures, being handsome and good, since they derived from those who exist they resemble these in beauty, though they are not truly equal with them since they had not issued from a union between him who had brought them forth and the one who had revealed himself to him. Nevertheless, he worked with wisdom and understanding, uniting himself completely with the word given to him. Therefore, what issued from him was great, just as that which exists is truly great. Having admired the beauty of those who had revealed themselves to him, he acknowledged, then, his thanks for their visitation. The Word effected this work by means of the ones from whom he had obtained help, in order that those who had come into being from him should be set aright and might receive something good, as he decided to pray that the fixed economy might attain all those who had gone forth from him. As a result, those whom he brought forth in accordance with this intention occupy chariots in the same way as the existing ones who had revealed themselves, so that they may traverse all regions of activities lying below, and each one may obtain his fixed place in accordance with what he is. This was a defeat for those who belong to the imitation, but for those who belong to the remembrance it was an act of beneficence and it was a revelation of the things that arose from the unitary and compassionate decision of the aeons, even if they are only seeds that have not yet come into being for themselves. For that which was manifested was a countenance of the Father and of the Concord. It was a garment composed of every grace and food, consisting of the things the Word had brought forth when he prayed and it received the glory and the praise he had performed with his eyes fixed on the ones to whom he prayed, so as to make perfect by means of them the images he brought forth. For the word greatly increased mutual cooperation and expectant hope, and they experienced happiness, deep rest, and undefiled pleasures. The things that he at first had only remembered, when they were not before him in their perfection, he now brought forth with an object of vision before him. 
it is revealed to him, but remaining in the hope and the faith of the Father, the completely perfect one, he has not yet been united with it, for fear that the ones who have come into being might perish from looking at the light, since they cannot sustain a greatness of such supreme magnitude. The Aeon of the Images Now, this thought of the Word, when he turned toward his consolidation and became master over those who had come into being because of him, was called Aeon and Place, for all those he brought into being in accordance with the decision of the Aeons. Further, it is called Assembly of Salvation, for it healed him from dispersion, which is the multiform thought, and turned him toward the single thought. Similarly, it is called Storehouse, because of the rest he attained and gave himself. Moreover, it is called Bride, because of his joy over what was given to him in the hope of the fruit that would issue from the union revealed to him. It is also called Kingdom, because of the consolidation he obtained when he rejoiced in his power over those who opposed him. And it is called the Joy of the Lord, because of the delight with which he clothed himself when the light was before him, giving him recompense for the good that was in him and the thought of freedom. This aeon we here have been talking about is above the two orders of those who were fighting against one another. It shares nothing with those who hold dominion, nor is it implicated in the sicknesses and the weaknesses belonging to the remembrance or to the imitation. For that in which the Word established himself, filled with joy, was an aeon. It had the form of one, but it also had the constitution of its cause, which is what had been revealed, since it was an image of those who exist in the fullness, and who had come into being out of the abundant delight of the one who is. In his joy, however, at the countenance of the one who had revealed himself, in his pleasure, his expectation, and the promise he had received of the things he had begged for, he possessed the word of the Son, together with his essence, his power, and his form. He was the one he desired and delighted in. He was the one who had been prayed for in love. This aeon was light and a desire to be set aright, an openness for instruction and an eye designed for vision, qualities that it had from those above. Moreover, it was wisdom for his thought against the ones who were placed lower in the economy, a word for speech and other perfect things of this kind. The individual members of this aeon. Those, moreover, who had been formed together with him after the image of the fullness have as their parents the ones who had revealed themselves, each one of them being a small impress of one of the figures, being male forms, since they have not originated from the sickness, which is femaleness, but from one who has already left the sickness behind they possess the name church, or harmoniously they resemble the harmony that reigns in the assembly of those who manifested themselves. That, in fact, which came into being after the image of the light is perfect itself, since it is an image of the single light that is, and that is the members of the all. Even if it was smaller than that of which it was an image, it nevertheless possesses its indivisibility because it is a countenance of the indivisible light. Those, however, who had come into being after the image of each one of the aeons are, in essence, that which we have said, but in their operation they are not equal to the aeons, because it occurs in each of them separately. When they are united with one another, they have equality, but as individuals they have not discarded what is proper to each. For that reason, they are passions, and passion is a form of sickness, for they are not offspring from the unity of fullness, but from one who has not yet attained the Father, or the unity with the members of the All and His will. Nevertheless, it was a good thing for the economy that was to be, because it had been decided concerning them that they should pass through the lower stations, 
and the stations would not be able to accept them coming quickly through them unless they came one by one. And their coming was necessary because everything was to be fulfilled through them. The Mandate of the Word in the Economy In short, then, at once the Word received all things, pre-existent, present, and future, having been entrusted with the economy of all that exists. Some were already realities, since their coming into being had been useful. Seeds that would come into being in the future, however, he kept within himself. Seeds deriving from the promise by which he had conceived, because it was a promise consisting of seeds of the future. And he gave birth to his offspring, which was the manifestation of that which he conceived. The seeds of the promise, however, were withheld for some time from coming into being, because they were such as had been appointed to be set out at the advent of the Savior and his companions. It is they who are the first, for the knowledge and the glory of the Father. It is necessary, because of the prayer he made, and the conversion that took place as a result, that some shall perish, others benefit, and others still be set apart. He prepared the punishment for those who had been disobedient, making use of the power of the one who was revealed and from whom he had received the authority over all things. In this way, he set himself apart from the things below and also situated himself at a distance from what is superior. And so he prepared the economy of everything that is on the outside and accorded to each his appropriate region the spiritual level. Arranging all things, the Word first set himself up as origin, cause, and ruler of the things that had come into being, after the model of the Father, who was the cause of the pre-existent establishment. Thereafter, he established the images that already existed, and that he had brought forth in thanksgiving and glorification. Then he arranged the abode of those he had brought forth by way of glorification, which is called paradise, enjoyment, delight full of nourishment, and delight of the pre-existent ones, reproducing the image of all the good things that exist in the fullness. Then he arranged the kingdom, which is like a city filled with everything that is agreeable, brotherly love, and great generosity and which was filled with the Holy Spirits and the strong powers that governed those the Word had brought forth, and thereby was established with strength. Then he arranged the station of the church that is assembled in this place and possessed the form of the church that exists among the aeons that give glory to the Father. After that, he arranged the station of the faith and the obedience that arise from hope, the very things the Word had received when the light was revealed, and then the disposition of prayer and supplication leading to forgiveness, and the Word about Him who will be revealed. All these spiritual stations are set apart by a spiritual power from those who belong to the remembrance, a power that consists of an image of what separates the Word from the fullness. The power is active in making them prophecy about the things to come, and it lets those who have come into being belonging to the remembrance, the pre-existent ones, without allowing them to mingle with those who had come into being through a vision of the figures before him. The Two Lower Orders Now, although those who belong to the remembrance, which is excluded from this, are subordinate, they still reproduce the likeness of what belongs to the fullness and in particular because of their sharing in the names with which they are adorned. Subordinate to those who belong to the remembrance is conversion, and also the law of judgment, which is condemnation and rage, is subordinate to them. Subordinate to these again is the power separating those who are below them, which throws them far off and does not allow them to spread upward to those who belong to the remembrance and conversion this power is fear and despair, oblivion, confusion, and ignorance. 
even these inferior ones who have come into being as an imitation from an illusion, are called by their higher names. Although they have no knowledge about the ones from whom they have issued through a presumptuous thought, lust for dominion, disobedience, and falsehood. To each of the two orders, moreover, he gave a name. Those who belong to the remembrance and the likeness are called those on the right, psychical, players, and the middle ones, while those who belong to the presumptuous thought and the imitation are called those on the left, material, darknesses, and the last ones. After having established each one in his rank, the images, the likenesses, and the imitations, the word kept the aeon of the image pure from all its adversaries as a place of joy. To those who belong to the remembrance, however, he revealed the thought of which he had stripped himself, with the intention that it should draw them into a communion with the material. This was in order to provide them with a structure and a dwelling place, but also in order that by being drawn toward evil, they should acquire a weak basis for their existence, so that, instead of rejoicing unduly in the glory of their own environment and thereby remaining exiled, they might rather perceive the sickness they were suffering from, and so acquire a consistent longing and seeking after the one who is able to heal them from this weakness. Over those who belong to the imitation, on the other hand, he placed the ordering word to provide them with form. He also placed over them the law of judgment, and, further, he also placed over them the powers that had their roots in the lust for dominion. He placed them to rule over them, so that the order should be kept in check either by the firmness of the wise word, by the threat of the law, or by the power of the lust for dominion, all of which diminished that order's evilness until the word was content with them as useful for the economy. The Hierarchy of the Cosmic Powers The word knows that the two orders share a common lust for dominion, and he granted the desire of both these and all the others. To each he gave an appropriate rank for the exercise of command, so that each would become the ruler of one station and activity, and renounce the place of whoever is superior to himself in order to command by his activity the inferior stations. Being in charge of the activity that it befell him to control on account of his mode of being. Thus, there came to be commanders and subordinates in positions of dominion and servitude, angels and archangels, with a variety of different kinds of activities. Each of the rulers, with the category and the grade that came to be his lot in accordance with the way they had appeared, took his position, having been given his charge in the economy. And so none of them is without a command, and none is without a king above him. From the ends of the heavens to the ends of the earth, as far as to the inhabited regions of the earth, and those who are below the earth, there are kings and there are masters, as well as those whom they command. Some are there to punish, others to give judgment, some to give relief and healing, others to instruct, and still others to keep watch. The Ruler and the Demiurge Over all these rulers he placed one ruler who is commanded by no one, since he is the Lord of them all. This is the representation that the Word brought forth from his thought as a likeness of the Father of the All. Because of that he is adorned with every name, being a likeness of him possessing all the qualities and all the glories. For he too is called Father, God, Creator, King, Judge, Place, Dwelling, and Law. The Word made use of him like a hand to order and work on the things below, and he used him like a mouth to say the things that should be prophesied. When he saw that the things he said and worked on were great, good, and marvelous, he rejoiced and was happy, as if he was the one who had spoken and had done these things by his own thoughts, for he was ignorant that the movement within him came from the spirit that moved him in a predetermined way toward what it wanted. 
the psychical realm. The things that came into being from him he spoke, and they came to be after the likeness of the spiritual stations we have discussed earlier in this section about the images. For he not only worked on but he himself also produced, in his capacity of father, his own economy and seeds. This took place, however, through the superior spirit that descended through him to the lower stations. And not only did he speak spiritual words as if they were his own, invisibly through the spirit that called out and produced things that were greater than his own nature. For since he was by nature a god and a father, and all the rest of such honorable titles, he thought that they were sprung from his own nature. He established rest for those who obeyed him, but the disobedient he sentenced to punishments. With him is also a paradise and a kingdom and everything else that exists in the aeon before him, although those things stand above these imprints because of the thought with which the latter are joined and which acts like a shadow or a veil, so that he does not see what the nature of the existing things really is. He set up for himself laborers and servants to assist him in the things he would do or say, for in every place where he worked he left his handsome figure by means of his name, while he worked and spoke the things he was thinking. He set up in his stations images of the light that had been revealed, and of the spiritual places, images deriving from his own nature. As a result, the stations were everywhere adorned by him, stamped with the figure of the one who had put them in place. And so they were established, paradises, kingdoms, rests, promises, and multitudes of servants to do his will. Though they are lords with dominion, they are all placed under the one who is lord and has appointed them. The Organization of the Material Realm After thus having listened to it well, he placed the lights that constitute the starting point of structure over the organization of the things below. The invisible spirit moved him in such a way that he too desired to administer an economy by means of a servant of his own one that he could also make use of like a hand and a mouth, and as if he had a face. What he brought forth were order, threats, and fear, so that those who had been acting without instruction should not hold the position they had been assigned to keep, being fettered to their places by the chains of the rulers who are over them. The whole constitution of matter is divided into three parts. The first powers, which the spiritual word, brought forth by illusion and presumption, he placed in the first spiritual rank. The ones that these brought forth, moreover, through lust for dominion, he placed in the middle region, since they, then, were powers of lust for dominion, so that they might rule and command the establishment under them, with compulsion and violence. Those, finally, who had come into being from envy and jealousy, and all the other progeny from this kind of disposition, he placed as a servant order controlling the last things and commanding all existing things and all procreation. From these derive the diseases that instantly destroy, and they are also impatient to procreate, although their existence is nothing in the place they have issued from, and to which they will once more return. Because of that, he placed over them commanding powers that continuously work on matter to ensure that the offspring that come into being may also have durability, for this is their glory. Part 2 Humanity What then is this form of fluid matter? A cause which is the blindness that derives from the powers, in it all of them as they procreate together with them, and perish. The thought placed between those on the right and those on the left is a power of simulation, so that all the things that the desire to do, with the result that they bring them forth in the same way that a shadow is projected by a body it follows, these are the roots of the visible creations. The creation 
of the human. Now, the whole establishment and organization of the images, likenesses, and imitations has come into being for the sake of those who need nourishment, instruction, and form, so that their smallness may gradually grow as through the instruction provided by the image of a mirror. That, in fact, is why he created the human last, after having prepared and provided for him the things that he created for his sake. The creation of the human happened in the same way as everything else. The spiritual word set it invisibly going, accomplishing it by means of the Demiurge and his subservient angels, who were joined in their modeling and their presumptuous thought and its rulers. Thus, the human became like an earthly shadow, so that he would be of the same kind as those who are cut off from the members of the All, and a creature made by them all, the ones on the right as well as the ones on the left, each of the orders forming the human, just as it itself was. For the form that the Word brought forth was deficient in such a way that he was afflicted by sickness. It did not resemble him, for he brought him forth into oblivion, ignorance, and all the other sicknesses, having given him only the first form. Now the Word gave him something through the Demiurge, without his knowledge, to let him know that there exists something higher and realize that he needed it. This is what the prophet called the breath of life and of the superior aeon, and this is the living soul that gave life to the substance that was dead at first, for that which is dead is ignorance. We must therefore conclude that the soul of the first human derives from the spiritual word even if the Creator thought that it was His, because that which was breathed went through Him as through a mouth. The Creator Himself also sent down souls out of His own substance, since He too has the ability to procreate, being derived from the likeness of the Father. And those on the left as well produced a sort of human being of their own, since they possessed the imitation. The spiritual substance is one and a single image. Its sickness is the condition, form. As for the substance of those who are psychical, its condition is double because it has an understanding of what is superior and confesses it, but it is also inclined toward evil on account of the inclination of the presumptuous thought. And as far as the material substance is concerned, its impulses are diverse and take many forms. It was a sickness that assumed many kinds of inclinations. The first human, then, is a mixed molding and a mixed creation and a depository of those on the left and those on the right, as well as of a spiritual word, and his sentiments are divided between each of the two substances to which he owes his existence paradise and the transgression of the first human. Because of this, it is also said that a paradise was planted for him, that he might eat from the fruit of three kinds of trees. It was a garden of the threefold order, and one that provides pleasures. The noble and distinctive substance in him was much superior to the creation, and was a blow to them. For that reason they issued a commandment, threatening him, and they brought over him great danger, death. Only the food of the bad trees did he allow him to eat and enjoy, whereas from that tree which had the double character he was not allowed to eat, and much less from that of life, in order that he might not acquire an honor equal to themselves, and also that he should not eat them. Through the evil power called the serpent, for he is more crafty than all the other evil powers. The human was deceived by a decision of those who belong to the remembrance and the desires. It made him transgress the commandment so that he should die, and he was expelled from that place and all its pleasures. This is the expulsion they made him suffer when he was expelled from the pleasures of those who belong to the imitation and those who belong to the likeness. It is, however, a work of providence, in order that it may be realized 
that the enjoyment the human being may have for such pleasures is short compared with the eternal existence of the place of rest. It was a work the Spirit had ordained, because it had planned in advance that the human should experience that great evil which is death, that is, the complete ignorance of all things, and also experience all the evils that arise from that, so that he, after the cravings and anxieties that result from these, might partake of the greatest good, namely, eternal life, which is the complete knowledge of the all, and the partaking of all good things. Because of the transgression of the first human, death reigned. It accompanied all humans in order to kill them as long as its rule remained, which it possessed and was given for a kingdom because of the economy of the Father's will, of which we have spoken before. Part 3. Confusion in the World, Errors of Greeks and Barbarians Whenever the two orders, those on the right and those on the left, are brought together by means of that thought which lies between them and gives them a common economy, it comes to pass that both of them perform their works with the same zeal, those on the right copying those on the left, and those on the left also copying those on the right. Sometimes the evil order begins, in a foolish fashion, to work some evil, and the wise order emulates it in the shape of a malefactor, it too doing evil, as if it were a power of evil. At other times, the wise order sets out to do good, and the foolish order emulates it, so as to do the same. This is how it is with the things that are constituted in this way by such deeds. They have come into being resembling things that are dissimilar, so that it has become impossible for the uninstructed to understand the cause of the things that exist. Because of that, they have put forward different explanations. Some say that the existing things exist by providence. These are the ones who observe the regularity of the movement of the creation and its reliability. Others say that it is something alien. These are the ones who observe the diversity and the lawlessness of the powers and its evil character. Others again say the existing things are what are destined to be. These are the ones who have occupied themselves with this matter. Others yet again say that it is in accordance with nature, and still others say that it is accidental. The great majority, however, have only reached as far as the visible elements and know of nothing more than these. Those who have become wise among the Greeks and the barbarians have reached as far as the powers that came into being from illusion and a vain thought as well as those who issued from these in turn by way of strife and in the manner of rebellion, and those powers have worked in them. Thus, when they spoke about the things they held to be wisdom, it was imitation, presumption, and illusory ideas, for the imitation had deceived them. They thought they had reached the truth, though it was error they had reached. This was not only because the names they were using were small, but the powers themselves prevented them by giving the impression that they were the all. From this it happened that the order was entangled in a struggle against itself, because of the presumptuous quarrelsomeness of the ruler who is before him. For this reason, nobody agreed with anybody else about anything, either in philosophy, medicine, rhetoric, music, or mechanics, but these are all opinions and theories. Consequently, verbosity ruled, and they were confused, since they were at a loss to explain those who ruled and gave them their ideas. The Insights of the Hebrews With regard to the things that have arisen from the people of the Hebrews, the scriptures, from the material powers whose model the Greeks reproduce, everything they thought so as to speak it, the powers on the right, who moved them all to think by means of words and a likeness of themselves. So they set out to reach the truth and use the mixed powers that were working in them. After that, they reached the order of the unmixed powers, 
before they reached the single one who is set up after the likeness of the Father. He is not invisible in his nature, but is veiled in wisdom so as to reproduce the type of the truly invisible one. Because of that, many angels have not attained a vision of him, nor have the humans of the Hebrew people, of whom we have spoken, that is, the righteous and the prophets. They thought nothing and said nothing that came from illusion or imitation or from an obscure thought, but from the power that was working in him, and being attentive to what he saw and heard, each one of them spoke faithfully, with mutual harmony and concord, after the manner of the ones who were working in them, because they preserved their unity and mutual harmony. This happened especially because they confessed that which was superior to themselves, and that something greater than themselves existed and had been established because they needed it. The spiritual word had produced this with them as something that was in need of that which is superior, as a hope and anticipation deriving from remembrance. This is the seed of salvation, and an illuminating word, which is the remembrance, and its offspring, and its emissions are the righteous and the prophets we have been speaking about. They preserve the confession and the testimony of their fathers concerning that which is great, those who came into being with an anticipation of hope and with attentiveness, and in whom was sown the seed of prayer and seeking, which is sown in many who have sought after confirmation. It manifests itself and leads them to love that which is higher, so as to proclaim these things as being about the one and the same. A single influence was working in them when they spoke. What they saw and spoke varied, however, because there were many who gave them their visions and their speech. Therefore, those who have listened to what has been said do not discard any of it, but have received the scriptures differently in their interpretations. They have set up many sects that remain even until now among the Jews. Some say that the God who made a proclamation in the ancient scriptures is one. Others say that they are many. Some say that God is simple and that he was of a single mind as to his nature. Others say that his actions embrace the principles of both good and evil. Some again say that he is the maker of the things that have come into being, whereas others say that he made them through his angels. The Prophecies Concerning the Savior Now, as to the many speculations of this kind, it is the great variety and the multiple forms of the scriptures that have given them, teachers of the law. The prophets, however, spoke nothing from themselves, but each of them from what he saw and heard of the proclamation about the Savior. That which he proclaimed, and which was the main point of their proclamation, was what he spoke about the coming of the Savior, namely, the fact of his coming. Sometimes, however, the prophets speak about him as if he is to come into being, while at other times as if the Savior is speaking through their mouths, saying that the Savior will come and show grace toward those who have not known him. Thus, by no means did they all agree with one another in their testimony. Rather, each one of them thought, by virtue of the activity by which he was empowered to speak about him and the station that he had happened to see, that over there was the place where the Savior would be born and that he would come from that place. Consequently, None of them understood where he would come from, or by whom he would be born. Instead, they were granted to say only this, he would be born and would suffer. As for his pre-existent being, however, and that which he is, eternally, as unborn and impassable, not of the word that came to be in the flesh, that did not enter their thoughts. And this is the word that they were empowered to speak concerning his flesh that would appear. They say that it is something born from all of them, but above all that it derives from the spiritual word, which is the cause of the things that came into being. He, from whom the Savior received his flesh, had indeed conceived him in a seminal form 
at the revelation of the light as a word giving promise of his revelation. It is, in fact, a seed of those who are, though it was produced last. The one, however, whom the Father appointed so as to reveal the salvation through him, and who is the fulfillment of the promise, having been, when descending into life, provided with all the instruments needed for his descent. His Father is one, and this is his only true Father, who is invisible, unknowable, and unattainable in his nature, and who is also the God who, by his will alone and his grace, let himself be seen, known, and attained. The Incarnation What our Savior became out of willing compassion is the same as that which the ones for whose sake he appeared had become because of an involuntary passion. They had become flesh and soul, and this holds them perpetually in its grip, and they perish and die. Those, however, who had come into being as an invisible human being, and invisibly, them he instructed about himself in an equally invisible manner. For not only did he assume their death for the ones he had in mind to save, but in addition he also assumed their smallness, to which they had descended when they were born with body and soul. For he let himself be conceived, and he let himself be born as a child with body and soul. All the other conditions as well that they, even if they possessed the light, shared with the ones who had fallen, he entered into, though he was exalted above them because he let himself be conceived without sin, pollution, or defilement. He was born into life, and he was in life, because it had been ordained that the former, no less than the latter, should become body and soul as a consequence of the passion and the aberrant sentiment of the word that had moved. The Incarnation of the Spiritual Seed Together with the Savior He, however, assumed, for the sake of the economy, that which resulted from the events we told about earlier, that which came into being from the radiant vision and the stable thought of the word after he had turned himself around, after his movement. In this way, those who came with him received body and soul together with stability, firmness, and discernment. It had been planned that they too should come when the coming of the Savior was planned. They came, however, only after he had decided it. So they came they too being far superior in their carnal emission compared to the ones who had been brought forth from deficiency. For in this way they too were emitted bodily together with the Savior by being manifested in union with Him. These are such as belong to the single substance, and that is the spiritual one. The economy, however, is variable, this being one thing, that another. Some have issued from passion and division. They need healing. Others derive from a prayer that the sick be healed. They have been appointed to care for those who have fallen. These are the apostles and the bringers of good tidings. They are, in fact, the disciples of the Savior. They are teachers for those who need instruction. Why then did they too partake of those sufferings that those who had been brought forth from passion shared in, if, in accordance with the economy, they were brought forth in one body together with the Savior, who did not partake of these sufferings. Now the Savior, in fact, was a bodily image of something unitary, namely the All. Therefore he preserved the model of indivisibility from which is derived impassibility. They, however, are images of each of those who were revealed. For that reason, they receive the division from their model, having been given form for that planting which exists down below, and which also partakes of the evil that exists in the regions to which they have arrived. For the will kept the all under sin, in order that by will he might show mercy on the all, and they might be saved, because a single one has been appointed to give life, whereas all the rest need salvation. The Proclamation of Salvation 
Because of this, he was the first one among them to whom it was granted to distribute those gifts that were then proclaimed by the ones he found worthy of making a proclamation to the others. Because the seed of the promise about Jesus Christ had been deposited, whose revelation and unification we have ministered to, this promise now enabled instruction and a return to that which they had been from the beginning, that of which they possessed a drop inciting them to return to it, which is what is called redemption. And that means to be released from captivity and to obtain freedom. The captivity is of those who were slaves of ignorance, which reigned in its own territories. Freedom, however, is the knowledge of the truth, which existed before ignorance came into being, and which reigns eternally, without beginning and without end. It is goodness, the healing of all things, the release from the slave nature in which those suffered, who had been brought forth in a lowly and vain thought, the nature that inclines toward evil, owing to that thought, which drags them down into the lust for power. They acquired that treasure which is freedom, from the abundant grace that looks to the children but overthrows passion and brings to naught the things that had been caused by the word. He had already rejected them at the moment when he separated them from himself, but he had postponed their destruction until the end of the economy, allowing them to exist because they too were useful for the things that had been ordained. The Three Kinds of Human Beings Now, humanity came to exist as three kinds with regard to essence, spiritual, psychical, and material, reproducing the pattern of the three kinds of disposition of the word, from which sprung material, psychical, and spiritual beings. The essences of the three kinds can be known from its fruit. They were nevertheless not known at first, but only when the Savior came to them, shedding light upon the saints and revealing what each one was. The spiritual kind is like light from light, and like spirit from spirit. When its head appeared, it immediately rushed to it. At once it became a body for its head. It received knowledge straight away from the revelation. The psychical kind, however, being light from fire, tarried before recognizing the one who had appeared to it, and still more before rushing to him in faith. Though it was instructed, moreover, only by means of voice, it was content that in this way it was not far from the hope given by the promise, having received in the form, as it were, of a pledge, the assurance of things to come. The material kind, however, is alien in every respect. It is like darkness that avoids the shining light because it is dissolved by its manifestation, or it did not accept his coming, and is even and filled with hatred against the Lord because he revealed himself. Now, the spiritual kind will receive complete salvation in every respect. The material kind will perish in every respect, as happens to an enemy. The cyclical kind, however, since it is in the middle by virtue of the way it was brought forth, as well as by virtue of its constitution, is double, being disposed to good as well as to evil, and the issue that is reserved for it is uncertain, and to proceed wholly into the things that are good. The Various Fates of Psychical People On the one hand, those that the Word brought forth in his mind after the model of what was pre-existent, when he remembered that which is superior and prayed for salvation, have salvation without any uncertainty. They will be completely saved because of this saving thought in accordance with what was produced from it. This is also the case with the ones that these in turn brought forth, whether they be angels or humans, because they acknowledge that there is something higher than themselves, and they pray and search for it. They will obtain the same salvation as the ones who brought them forth, for they are of a disposition that is good. They were assigned to the service of the proclamation of the coming of the Savior before it happened, 
as well as of his revelation after he had come. Whether angel or human, these have, by the fact of being nominated for this service, acquired the essence of their being. On the other hand, those that issued from the thought of lust for domination, who originated from the assault of the ones who opposed him, are the products of that thought. Being, for that reason, mixed, the end they will get is uncertain. Those who rid themselves of the lust for domination that was given them temporarily and for short periods, who give glory to the Lord of glory and who abandon their rage, will be recompensed for their humility by being allowed to endure indefinitely. Those, however, who arrogantly pride themselves in their vainglorious lust, who love temporary glory, who are oblivious to the fact that the power they have has been entrusted to them only for a limited time and period, and for that reason have not acknowledged that the Son of God is the Lord of the All and the Savior, and who have failed to rid themselves either of their fury or their way of imitating those who are evil, they will receive judgment for their ignorance and their senselessness, namely suffering. This applies to those who have gone astray, all those among them who turned away, or even worse, who persisted in such a way that they too committed such indignities against the Lord as the powers on the left committed against him, even to the extent of causing his death, thinking, we shall become the rulers of the all if he who has been proclaimed king of the all is killed. And those humans and angels who do not originate from the good disposition of the ones on the right, but from the mixture, endeavored to do this. They have willingly chosen for themselves transient honor and lust. For those on the right who will be saved, the road to eternal rest leads from humility to salvation. After having confessed the Lord, having given thought to what is good for the church, and having sung together with it for the hymn of the humble, they will, for all the good they have been able to do for it, sharing its afflictions and sufferings like people who have consideration for what is good for the church, partake of the fellowship in hope. This applies to humans as well as to angels. Similarly, the road for those who are of the order of those on the left leads to perdition, not only because they denied the Lord and plotted evil against him, but also because their hatred, envy, and jealousy are directed against the church as well. And this is the reason for the condemnation of those who were agitated and rose up to cause trials for the church. The Election and the Calling The election is consubstantial with the Savior and of one body with him. Because of its oneness and union with him, it is like a bridal chamber. For more than anything else, it was for its sake that the Savior came. The Calling on the other hand, occupies the place of those who rejoice at the bridal chamber, who are glad and happy on account of the union of the bridegroom and the bride. Thus the station that the calling will have is the aeon of the images in the place where the word has not yet been united with the fullness. And for this the human being of the church is glad, rejoices in it, and hopes for it. It was composed of spirit soul and body on account of the economy of the planner the salvation of the savior and of his limbs now the human inside him was a single one for he was the all and he was all of them and he possessed what was flowing from the father to the extent that the various stations were able to receive it but he also possessed those limbs that we have described above once the redemption had been proclaimed, the perfect human immediately received knowledge so as to return swiftly to his unity, to the place from which he came. Joyfully he returned back to the place from which he had originated, the place from which he had flowed forth. His limbs, however, needed a school, such as exists in the regions that have been so fashioned as to provide it with the likeness of the images and the archetypes in the manner of a mirror, until all the limbs of the body of the church would be united in one place, 
and would attain the restoration together by appearing as the sound body, the restoration to the fullness, the final restoration. The fullness possesses a first mutual concord and union, which is the concord that exists for the glory of the Father, and through which the members of the All acquire a representation of Him. The final restoration, however, will take place after the All is manifested in Him who is the Son, the One who is the Redemption, who is the road toward the incomprehensible Father, who is the return to the pre-existent, and after the members of the All have been manifested in Him, who is truly the inconceivable, ineffable, invisible, and ungraspable One, so that the All obtains its redemption. The redemption is not only a release from the domination of those on the left, and not just an escape from the authority of the ones on the right, to each of whom we thought we were slaves or children, and from whom nobody gets loose without quickly becoming theirs once more. Rather, the redemption is also an ascent, and those levels that exist in the fullness and with all those who have been given names and who comprehend them according to the capacity of each individual aeon, and it is an entry into that which is silent, where there is no need of voice, nor of understanding, comprehension, or illumination, but all things are luminous and have no need of illumination. For not only earthly humans need the redemption, but the angels need the redemption as well. And the image and even the fullness of the aeons and those marvelous luminous powers needed it, so as to leave no doubt with regard to anyone. And even the sun, who constitutes the type of the redemption of the all, needed the redemption, having become human and having submitted himself to all that was needed by us, who are his church in the flesh. After he, then, had received the redemption first, by means of the word that came down upon him, all the rest who had received him could then receive the redemption through him. For those who have received the one who received have also received that which is in him. For the redemption began to be given among the humans who were in the flesh, with his firstborn and his love, the Son, coming in the flesh, and the angels who were in heaven having been found worthy of forming a community, a community in him upon the earth. For this reason it is called the Father's angelic redemption, and with him comforting those who had suffered on behalf of the all for the sake of his knowledge, for he was given grace before anyone else. The Father's Plan Now the Father knew him in advance, since he existed in his deliberations before anything had yet come into being, where he also had the ones for whom he revealed him. He lay the deficiency upon that which lasts for limited periods of time, for the glory of his fullness. It is in fact that he was unknown that made it possible for him to show his benevolence by making himself known, and thus receiving knowledge about him is a manifestation of his generosity and the revelation of his abundant sweetness, which is the second glory. Consequently, in this way he is, in fact, the cause of ignorance as well as the originator of knowledge. In hidden and inscrutable wisdom, he guarded the knowledge until the end, until the members of the All would have labored in their search for God the Father, whom no one has found by his own wisdom and power. And then he grants them to attain knowledge of this great gift of his by means of that superior thought and that method which he has given them and which consists in ceaseless thanksgiving to him. Out of his immovable counsel, he then reveals himself for eternity to the ones who have proved worthy of receiving, by his will, the knowledge about the Father who is unknowable in his nature. It was premeditated in the Father's wisdom that the ones for whom he had planned that they should attain knowledge, as well as all the good things that come with it, should, in addition, also experience ignorance and its pains. Thus they would taste the things that are evil, and would be trained through them as a temporary, 
obtain the enjoyment of the things that are good for eternity. The fact that they mark themselves out and are continually rejected and accused by their adversaries is something they carry as an ornament and a marvelous sign of the superior things. This was to make it evident that the ignorance of whoever was ignorant of the Father was of his own making, whereas that which gave them knowledge about him was a power from him enabling them to obtain it. This knowledge is rightly described as the knowledge of everything that can be thought and a treasure. And to give more knowledge in addition to that, it is also the revelation of the ones who were known in advance and the road toward the concord and the pre-existent, which means that those acquire greatness who have renounced the greatness that was theirs in the economy of the will in order that the end may be just as the beginning was. Baptism. As for the true baptism, into which the members of the all descend and where they come into being, there is no other baptism except the one, and that is the redemption, which takes place in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, after confession of faith has been made in those names, which are the single name of the good tidings, and after one has believed that the things one has been told are real. And on account of this, whoever believes in their reality will obtain salvation, and that means to attain, in an invisible way, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but only after one has borne witness to them in unfaltering faith, and if one grasps them in a firm hope. In this way, it may happen that the fulfillment of what one has believed becomes a return to them, and that the Father becomes one with him, the Father, God, whom he has confessed in faith, and who has granted him to be united with himself in knowledge. The baptism we have spoken about is called the garment that is not taken off by the ones who put it on, and that is worn by the ones who have received redemption, and it is called the confirmation of truth, which never fails in its constancy and stability, and holds fast those who have obtained restoration while they hold on to it. It is called silence because of its tranquility and unshakability. It is also called the bridal chamber because of the concord and the inseparability of the ones whom he has known and who have known him. It is also called the unsinking and fireless light, not because it sheds light, but rather because those who wear it and those who are worn by it as well are made into light. It is also called the eternal life, which means immortality. Thus it is called after all the fair things it contains, including the names that have been left out, in a manner that is simple, authentic, indivisible, irreducible, complete, and unchangeable. For how else can it be named except by referring to it as the all? That is, even if it is called by innumerable names, they are spoken only as a way of expressing it in certain ways, although it transcends all words, transcends all voice, transcends all mind, transcends all things, and transcends all silence. This is how it is, with the things that belong to what it is. This is what it in fact is, with an ineffable and inconceivable character, in order to be in those who have knowledge, by means of what they have attained, which is that to which they have given glory, the salvation of those who are called. Even if there are many more things that could be said on the subject of the election, and which it would be fitting to mention, it is nevertheless necessary that we speak once more about those who belong to the calling, for this is how those on the right are named, and it would not be profitable for us to forget them. We have spoken about them as if the limited description above was sufficient. How then is it that we have spoken only partially about them? Well, I said that all those things have gone forth from the word, either from the condemnation of the things that are evil, or from the rage that fought against them, or the turning away from them, which is the conversion toward the superior things, or the prayer 
in the remembrance of the pre-existent things, together with the hope and the faith that the salvation of that which is good might be obtained. All these have become worthy because they originate from those good dispositions, and they have, as the cause of their birth, a sentiment that derives from that which is. Moreover, I said that before the Word himself had occupied himself with them in an invisible manner, and willingly, that which was superior had also supplied them with that thought which I mentioned above, because they had been obedient to it, and that thought was what became the cause of their existence. And they did not exalt themselves because they were healed, as if no one existed before them. Rather, they acknowledge that they have an origin of their existence, and they desire to know what that is that exists before them. In addition to that, I said that they greeted the light when it appeared in the form of lightning, and they bore witness that it had appeared for their salvation. Now, not solely about those who came forth from the word did we say that they will attain that which is good, but the ones to whom these gave birth in turn in accordance with those good dispositions will also partake of that repose as a consequence of the abundance of grace. And even those who were brought forth from the desire of lust for domination, having inside them the seed that is lust for domination, will receive the recompense of good things, if they have worked together with those who are predisposed toward good things, and provided they decide to do so deliberately, and are willing to abandon their vain love of temporary glory, so as to do the command of the Lord of glory, and instead of that small temporary honor, they will inherit the eternal kingdom. It was necessary for us to return what we had spoken about earlier, now, however, we must join the premises thus laid down to the reasons and the evidence as to whether all those on the right, whether unmixed or mixed, may receive the grace of salvation and repose, so as to make a consistent argument. This means that we shall establish, in a compelling discourse, a demonstration from the form of their faith. If, in fact, we confess the kingdom in Christ, it is for the abolishment of all diversity inequality, and difference. For the end will regain the form of existence of a single one, just as the beginning was a single one. The place where there is no male and female, nor slave and free man, nor circumcised and uncircumcised, nor angel and human, but all in all is Christ. How can one who did not exist at first be found to come into being unless the nature of the one who is not a slave, since he will take place together with a free man, or they will even obtain direct vision, so that they will no longer have to believe on account only of a small word produced by a voice, that this is how things are. For the restoration back to that which was is a single one. Even if some are exalted because of the economy, having been set up as causes for the things that happened, unfolding numerous physical forces and taking pleasure in them, they, angels as well as humans, will obtain the kingdom, the confirmation, and the salvation. And here are the reasons. Those who had been revealed in the flesh believed without hesitation that he was the son of the unknown God, the one that had not been spoken about before and whom no one had been able to see and they abandoned the gods they had served before and the lords who are in heaven as well as the ones on earth. Even before he had been taken up to heaven, and even when he was still a child, these bore witness that he had already begun to preach. And when he lay in the tomb as a dead man, the angels thought that he was alive, and they received life at the hand of the one who had died. The many acts of worship and wonders they used to perform in the temples, these now gave over to another. The confession is what gave these the power to do it, on account of their hastening toward him. That institution was something they had gotten only so that they should renounce it for the sake of the one who was not shown honor here below. But instead they got Christ, and they understood that he came from the superior place, the place from which they had come together with him from a place divine and sovereign, 
the names that the ones they had been worshipping, tending to, and serving had received on loan, they now gave over to the one who was truly called by them. Those, however, realized only after his assumption that he was their Lord, who has no Lord over him. They then gave him their kingdoms, they rose from their thrones, and they laid down their crowns. He, however, revealed himself to them for the reasons we have mentioned before, that they might be healed and turn to the good thought toward friend and the angels and the many good things they have done for it. In this way, they were entrusted with the services that benefited the elect as they brought the inequity they suffered up to heaven to be eternally tried by the incontrovertible and infallible judgment, and they remain for their sake until they have all entered into earthly life and have passed out of it. As long as their bodies remain on the earth, they minister to all there and make themselves partners in their afflictions, persecutions, and tribulations, which have been brought upon the saints more than anyone else. As for the servants of evil, however, since evil deserves destruction, with firmness on account of that communal life which is above all the worlds, and which is their good thought and friendship. And the church will remember them as good friends and faithful servants once it has been redeemed. And it will give them the reward consisting of the joy that reigns in the bridal chamber, and which is in its house, which is in the thought, and that which it owes. Christ, who is with it, and the expectation of the Father of the All, and it will provide them with guiding and serving angels. For the aeons will remember their benevolent thought with which they serve the church, and will give them their reward for all their consideration. This is an omission from them, in order that just as Christ will, which brought forth from the great and exalted things for the church and gave them to it, so this emission too will become a thought for these and will provide them with dwelling places where they will dwell eternally after they have renounced the downward attraction of deficiency and the power of the fullness has pulled them upward on account of the great generosity and the sweetness of the pre-existent aeon. The End of Time This is the nature of everything that was produced as a result of what Christ had with him when he shone upon them with a light that revealed as his, which will be just as his, the only difference that exists among those who have been, those who are, by means of value in the way I have already explained, while the material beings will be left behind until the end to perish, for they will not give there, if they have returned once more to that which, in the way that they were, while they do not exist, but they had been useful for the time that they were among them, even if they are not at first then, to do something else by means of the power they had in the establishment to oppose them. Even if I continue to make use of such words, his thoughts, greatness, all angel words, through the sound of a trumpet, which will announce the great and complete reconciliation from the resplendent east in the bridal chamber, which is the love of God, in accordance with the power that of the greatness, the sweetness of his, as he reveals himself to the greatnesses, his goodness, the praise, the power, and the glory through Jesus Christ the Lord, the Savior, the Redeemer of all those who are embraced by the mercy of love, and through his Holy Spirit, from now throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.